The Christmas Journey. Everyone has heard of spring cleaning. It is, of course, as common as cabbage. But Mrs Newton loved to dust at Christmas. She would clean the house, she said, for baby Jesus. It was as though each year she was expecting a knock on the door from Mary and Joseph. There was always room in the Newton house, despite the three children, a hamster and a cat. The house was huge. Mrs Newton had inherited it from her father, and who could tell what ancestors were still lurking in its many chilly rooms. Some doors were never opened, others were always kept locked. There should have been maids, but time had moved on and the Newtons were not at all wealthy. There should have been central heating, but that had not been invented in the Middle Ages when the house had been new. For most of the year the dust would settle on clocks with cherubs, on tapestries and suits of armour, measured for giants or dwarves. The house, to tell the truth, was not clean. But at Christmas the effort was always made. Mrs Newton would break out the aprons, the feather dusters and the polish on a day specially ringed on the advent calendar. Then apron strings would be tied with little fuss round the waists of Jason, Ken and Sally, the Newton tribe. Now children, Mrs Newton would say, seek out all the dusty corners with your dusters and be sure especially to get rid of all the filthy cobwebs. We don't want nasty spiders spoiling Christmas. Close to a plaster rose in one corner of the ceiling, Ted, the living room spider, heard that dreaded instruction from Mrs Newton. He quivered to the tips of his eight little legs. Perhaps if I keep still, he thought, the children won't notice me. But Sally, looking up, had seen the cobweb shaking, and she saw the small brown star within its heart. Ted looked down with his ten big frightened eyes. He saw Sally's freckled face approaching, her blue eyes turned upwards, her brow creased with pure determination, a lick of ginger hair across her frown. Ted saw the feather duster rising, slowly, so slowly as though in slow motion, then his world was rushing air and darkness as he fell. When the little spider came round, the children had gone, and so had the cobweb, his home. It was night, and the lights from a Christmas tree filled the four walls with all the colours of the rainbow, and some more besides. Ted loved Christmas trees. In other years he had enjoyed seeing the tree come in. Always it would be carried by the three breathless children. They would find a good spot for it, then decorate with cries of joy, electric candles and glittering baubles. This year, when all that had taken place, Ted had been dead to the world on the carpet. Realising what had happened and what he had missed, he started to weep big spider tears. Christmas is not for spiders, he said. We only spoil Christmas, Mrs Newton said so herself. Then Ted noticed how one of his legs was missing, snapped away by the blow from the feather duster. He knew, as a spider, that his leg would grow back, but that cheered him up not one bit. Something was missing inside him. It was the idea that somebody loved him, the fact that nobody did. Well, that hurt him far more than the loss of a leg. But something more than pain filled his thoughts. Ted shut his ten great eyes in sorrowful drowsiness, and at once he saw a great silver spider. It seemed to fill the sky of his imagination. It was a light in the dark, and its legs stretched from one end of space to another. Ted knew the name of that silver spider. He spoke the name aloud. Astoran. People have their Christmas stories. Spiders have their stories too. And in many of those tales, the hero is Astoran. When God first made the earth and filled it with spiders, for truly there are still more spiders than human beings, the Almighty was worried by the antics of the comets which were lining up to have a peek at the world. To each of the comets he gave free will, which he later granted to man himself. The comets were God's first experiment. He wished to observe their behaviour. Some comets were well behaved. They would keep to orderly courses around the waking earth, or waiting their turn for another near visit. These comets collided with nothing in the heavens. If some saw the world only once in a thousand years, it was enough, for they carried in their hearts the dream of a blue-green planet. 
Other comets were more willful and excited by the sight of such a wonder. They would break from their courses to sweep past the earth again and again and again and once more. God could have caught them, but he was too busy worrying about Adam, who was lonely in Eden and dreaming of Eve. So the Lord, half distracted, waved into being Astoran the spider. From then on, whenever comets strayed too close to the world, it was Astoran who trapped them in his dark and invincible webs. The spider saved mankind from doom so many times, but because he is as dark as space itself, he cannot be seen from the earth. We cannot guess the many debts we owe to him. There are many comets in Astoran's nets, all dead or dying. Any one of them, in willfulness, might have struck the world and destroyed it, had it not been for the catcher and his weavings. For all this, people have always hated spiders. Perhaps they somehow sense that out there, in the cold and the emptiness, great legs are stirring, walking on the face of infinity. When we look to the stars, the eyes of the spider are looking at us. No wonder we shudder. Yet on one cold winter's evening, People could see what they had feared in the night for so long. The angels called Astoran closer to the earth so that he could enjoy their singing for once. The spider had felt lonely and did as he was told. As the angels flew around him, the light from their wings and faces shone upon his dark, hairy body so that he began to shine, every leg and every armoured plate. Far, far below, on earth, the shepherds in their frosty fields saw a shining light with eight bright rays. In a desert palace, three fat kings with telescopes gazed upon the dazzling form of Astoran. It is a sign! It is a sign! It is a sign! They gabbled to each other, hopping and pointing. God was very pleased with Astoran, and he blessed him above every other creature with the exception of man. People blessed Astoran too, and they called him the Christmas Star. Ted's thoughts of Astoran should have made him proud to be a spider, but they did not. The glory of the great spinner made him feel small. What, after all, was Ted but a sad little mite with a missing leg? Please, God, said Ted, how shall I make you bless me when I am so tiny and so alone? How can I make people love me when even the children are told to hurt me? Astoran is fortunate, for he has never lived among mankind. It was then that Ted, glancing up, Notice the Christmas angel, there, on the top of the Christmas tree. Ah, said Ted, astonished by her beauty. Oh, angel, he said, fly down to me. Let your face shine upon me and your silver wings, so that I may shine too and be pleasing to God. The angel only smiled a plaster smile, fixed and rouged. Ted adored the folds in her flowing red robes, the crown of golden tinsel. Oh, angel, he said, remain there on the top of the tree and I will climb to you, for surely you have heard the voice of God. Perhaps you will tell me how to serve him, as Astoran served him long ago. Still, the angel smiled a plaster smile. Unbalanced by the loss of a leg, Ted hobbled across the carpet to the tree's red stoneware pot. Soon he had climbed to the top of the drum-like container to the soil and the grit around the trunk. The tree also was easy to climb, despite being high, for Ted was a mountaineer spider, always careful on the rope, inching here and swinging there. Halfway up, he saw a light. It came from a golden orb. Its surface caught the colours of the candles, red, blue and green. Surrounded by the beauty of the lights, Ted saw his own reflection. Ten spider eyes looked back at him. He saw his hairy legs, with one leg missing. He wept great spider tears, and he rocked it backwards and forwards on a twig. I should let myself fall, he told himself. No wonder the children hate me. The truth is, I am ugly. I shall fall and throw no rope to save me. He looked up for one last glance at the angel. But the angel was hidden by criss-crossing boughs and a galaxy of Christmas decorations. Ted shuddered to think of all the reflections that lay ahead of him in those cold and glassy orbs. But something made him look again. There, between a golden trumpet and a pearly moon, was that not a silver leg? Astoran, Ted gasped. 
and he reached for the twig above him, making certain that his safety rope was fixed around a pine cone. So he continued to climb, excited, until he reached the spot he desired and stood before a silver spider, the image of Astoran himself. Mm, he's not as large as I thought, Ted mused, by now very weary. He greeted the famous spider, but the comet catcher never answered. Only now and then a breeze would rustle the hairs on Astoran's legs. Ted knew it would be rude to fall asleep in the presence of such greatness, but he could not help himself. The climb had been so long, so difficult and so tiring. There, on a branch, before a tinsel star, Ted enjoyed the best dream of his life. Ted dreamt that he was Astoran, that the angels sang for him and gave him their brightness. Then he looked down from the tree to the living room below and he saw how Mary and Joseph were bending over a major. A donkey was rubbing its flank against the television. An ox was chewing up the carpet and swallowing the wool with slow, peaceful gulps. There came a knock on the living room door and in walked three young shepherds. One had a lamb under his arm, another had a lute. Behind the shepherds were three old kings, all very fat, all dressed in silks and sashes. Every king wore a turban each one waved a telescope with excitement. Oh no, we forgot the presents, said the eldest, tugging his long grey beard which had almost grown to his belly button. When Ted awoke, he felt more useless than ever. How could a seven-legged spider be like Astoran? Again he wept great spider tears. They tumbled through the branches of the tree. It was then that the angel spoke to Ted at last. Ted, said the angel, Astoran is a lonely spider, just like you, but he must do his duty. In the dark of night, watching out for willful comets, Astoran must remain until the end of time. Then his reward will be truly great, for he is pleasing to God. But how can I please God? Ted whined. I'm just a little spider with only seven legs and I'm so ugly. I am not like Astoran. Ted, said the angel, you are as God made you. As for your purpose, sometimes that is not for you to know. All you may do is travel with faith and hope. Now climb a little higher and rest under the folds of my scarlet robes. Your journey has been long indeed. Ted did as he was told, and he spent the rest of the night asleep under silken folds in the watchful care of the angel. Come the morning, which was Christmas Day, Ted was awake before he knew it. Ooh, said the children together, that is so beautiful. Ted crept to the edge of the angel's robes and he peered out. Jason, Ken and Sally were hand in hand before the Christmas tree. Quick, Mum, Sally shouted. The angels in the night have covered the tree with silver threads, with necklaces of frost and crystal, with moonbeams. Oh, look, oh, look, it's lovely. What can those children mean? Ted wondered. Then he remembered all the cobwebs he had cast, just to reach to the top of the tree. Every branch was silvered and shining, catching the sun which flickered through the windows like a blessing. Christmas is for spiders after all, Ted murmured. I'm glad that I have pleased them. I'm glad that the children are happy. And he closed his ten big spider eyes and he smiled.